My name is Ryan Walsh. I'm a partner at Floodgate. Uh, we are an early stage VC firm. Uh, we do do marketplace investments if you're looking for seed stage capital. Um, I personally focus on, um, on marketplaces, consumer businesses, and pretty much anything that involves some level of um, social psychology. So that's pretty broad. Um, and we're here, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, investing in marketplaces. So I'll let these guys introduce themselves and then we'll, we'll get started. Hey everybody, um, Matt Kohler from Benchmark. We uh, also do a lot of marketplace investing historically and currently and in the future. Um, we're principally focused on Series A. Um, the labels have kind of gotten amorphous over the last few years, but um, what we mean by that is typically uh, committing to taking a board seat, having meaningful ownership in the company, and staying involved at the board level for a very long time in the business. Um, I also would like to say I've been to Austria many times. I was in the back of the room, so probably couldn't see my hand there, but I, rec <laughs> I recommend it highly for those of you who have not. It's an amazing place. I'm good. I'm thinking I'm Mike. Yeah, you guys can share. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Roger Lee, and I work at Battery Ventures. First, I want to thank Dan and everybody else that put this together. We, we've been talking internally about doing an event like this for a while. Uh, and so really appreciate you guys uh, doing all the work. This is a non-trivial amount of, of energy sure. that goes into doing this. So yeah. thanks to, to all you guys for making this happen. And, and excited that this is the inaugural of what will hopefully be an annual uh, you know, get together going forward. Um, so uh, Battery Ventures is a, a stage agnostic firm, which means we invest across the spectrum. We'll do seed investing. We also do Series A, which we're going to talk about today. But we'll also invest in companies at, at later stages as well. Uh, we're very active in marketplaces. We've been investing in marketplaces for, for a long, long time. Uh, we have probably 15 or so marketplaces in the portfolio right now. We invest in probably you know one to two uh, every year. Um, and uh, excited to be here and t uh, talk more. Cool, thanks. Uh, so I just thought we'd start off with like a, a pretty general level setting question, which is when a company comes in to meet with you guys, or you, you meet a new entrepreneur, how do you know that they're operating a marketplace versus a different type of network? Because there's a lot of things that are disguised as marketplaces and also marketplaces that are disguised as other things. Um, that's a great question and I think, you know, probably encompasses the totality of, of, of what <laughs> matters for the purpose of this conversation. Um, so I think, I mean, we can talk about like what a marketplace is and isn't, but leaving that aside for a second, um, you know, what, what we look for is a marketplace that, you know, even though it's early, it's a Series A level, is alive, is, is a, a kind of a living thing. Um, and, you know, as you were alluding to, isn't like a fake marketplace, it's an actual marketplace. So what's the difference between a fake marketplace and an actual marketplace? Um, usually when you're at the Series A stage, you can just start to see the beginning glimmers of life on this. So, you know, don't want to kind of over rotate into how developed this needs to be. But really, I think the difference between whether you have a living, breathing marketplace or something that's, you know, in actuality about demand general lead gen or is being propped up, you know, through artificial spend is the difference between whether or not you're starting to feel a natural pull on both the buyer and seller side of the equation. Um, and to be more specific about, you know, what that doesn't look like, um, I think if you're propping up your demand through a lot of early variable marketing spend, that's a really scary sign. So if I look at a, a marketplace company early on, and most of the demand is coming from paid direct acquisition, it's like, gee, why do they have to do that? Why, why aren't people naturally noticing and paying attention? Um, the supply side, it's usually a little easier to get the supply side on because most suppliers say, yeah, sure, I'll put my stuff up here. Why not? No harm. Doesn't cost me anything. Maybe I'll get some business. Great. Um, but really, I think figuring out whether the demand side is starting to take notice or not is the critical question. How you get to there is a corollary question, which we could talk about. But I think that's what you're solving for, is getting the demand side to really organically be paying attention to what's going on here. Um, that's, of course, an easier thing, you know, easier said than done, harder thing than it sounds like. Um, but I think if you start to see the signs of life on the demand side naturally, as opposed to artificially, um, that's more than anything where you start to feel like, you know, maybe there's something real going on here. The second last thing I'll say is um, 
I think there's a really big, and this gets in the question of what's really a marketplace and isn't a marketplace. Um, you know, a marketplace, of course, is when you bring together a disaggregated group of buyers and sellers. Um, you sit in the middle of those things to enable them to find one another, and you can build a very powerful network effect in doing that. But not all of these things are actually transactionalized. And I think a lot of times you end up in a situation where you have a proxy for that, where you aren't fully transactionalized. We can come back to that and talk about it more. But one of the things that that can correlate with not always the case, but sometimes the case, is something which is actually a lead gen service rather than a true marketplace where people are doing business with one another within the context of this environment. Um, and so that, you know, the opposite of those things is when you start to see, you know, th this feels like it's living and breathing and it's not being artificially propped up. Um, and ultimately, last thing I'll say is, I think the real litmus test is if you, if you can believe that either today or in short order, there's a path for both the buyers and the sellers to look at this place as the preferred place where they accomplish this transaction, then you've got something really, really interesting. So, you know, if you're, if, if you're the place very early on, we were lucky to be the Series A investors at eBay and Benchmark long before I got there, but I've heard a lot of stories about this. Um, and you know, early on, they kind of built their backs on, they built their business on the back of this, of this fish tackle collectibles vertical, actually. And early on, there's this Pez dispenser story, but that's like urban legend. It's about the fish tackle collectibles. And early on, if you were nerding out, and duck decoys, apparently, if you're nerding out on like fishing stuff, like duck decoys, fish tackle collectibles, it pretty early and quickly became, this is the place where you go to get that stuff. And that was obvious and organic and not forced. And that's, maybe it was limited, but that was something really interesting and alive. And I think that same thing applies to a lot of the marketplace businesses that we've invested in. Yeah, Keep I'm good. Yeah. No, no, yeah. all good. Yeah, um, so just building on Matt's comment, we, we have a pretty simple definition of what is a marketplace, and it's simply an online kind of space where two or more parties aggregate together to execute some transaction that would be either very hard or impossible in the offline world. And, and then we have a, a framework that we use internally, even for our Series A investments, knowing that they're not you know, fully mature and knowing that they're still experimenting and learning a lot, but, but it's good to at least have a framework to assess kind of where they fit in this landscape. So first and foremost, we'll always look at market size. So even if you're starting at Fish Tackle, if you apply this to a broader set of verticals, how big is this TAM? How big can this market be? And ideally, it's a category that if this actually take holds, there's you know, 50 billion or more of total GMV spent in this category that the marketplace can somehow capture. Second we look at is fragmentation. We're always you know, biasing towards marketplaces that are highly fragmented on both the, the supply and demand side. We find that marketplaces that aren't typically lose some leverage from one of the, one of the sides, and it's hard for them to capture real kind of durable value. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time talking about something internally called growth efficiency, and it, it's uh, very similar to the way Matt was describing. We can spend more time describing exactly what growth efficiency is, and actually Andre commented a little bit about it, but in our mind, it's a matter of how efficient is your growth and how scalable can it be, and there's a bunch of variables that come into that around your acquisition costs, the durability of the buyers and the suppliers, how frequently they're engaging, what do your contribution margins look like, and again, we can go into those specific KPIs later if you want to. Um, we, th we think a lot about shadow markets and is there the ability to create new use cases that just didn't exist before. Uh, Uber is a classic example here where it started as a, um, you know, a taxi service or a black car service is now fundamentally changing you know, transportation and people don't buy cars anymore. They don't need to. Um, and then finally is, is um, the network effects that come into play. And there's obviously a wide range of network effects that could be, you know, could, could be discussed. But it's more than just actually the product or the service uh, becoming better over time for the end user as it scales. It's actually creating a very deep moat. And it's one that is going to be prohibitively hard, if not impossible, for a competitor to, to enter that market. So when we kind of look at all those, those variables together in our framework, those, again, we, we try to come to an assessment for whether or not this is a good you know, Series A investment for us. But again, happy to kind of double click in any specific one of those to give, give folks a, a better, you know, clear sense of this KPIs or kind of how we, how we map different companies against those yeah, criteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, let me double click in one. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so you talk about this shadow market mm -hmm. idea, um, which I think dovetails in a really interesting way with another thing you talked about, which is TAM. Um, so, you know, to use the Uber example from really early on, we were also lucky enough to do the Series A at, in Uber at, at Benchmark. And um, I remember when we were talking about the company, I'm sure everybody who, you know, considered the company was talking about this question. 
there was, of course, this question around how, how big is the TAM for this? Right. How big can this market yeah. be? And you know, there were a bunch of ways you could come at it. I think it would have been pretty grandiose to say, oh, well, you all, the market is point-to-point -point transportation on the planet. You know, just like you know, at the early days at, at the Facebook, other than if you were as visionary of an entrepreneur as Mark is, you know, to come into it and say, oh yeah, you know, the market for this is like every person on earth is gonna use this thing and it's being used by kids at Ivy League colleges, like give me a break. Um, so, you know, we did our own analysis on that in terms of what could the potential be for something like Uber. Um, I don't think any of us advocated that it could be, you know, all point-to-point -point private transportation, but I do remember we used proxies like the parking market and you know say like well look at all the disposable opex that people put into consumers put into parking and gee maybe there's a substitute market here where it's not just taxis right. but it's all that money you spend driving your own freaking car around putting money into the parking meters parking in garages etc just trying to somehow triangulate your way to what it could be and i paint that example to kind of ask you about this question of how do you reconcile the shadow market notion with the TAM notion, because yeah, sure. TAM's a dangerous thing. Yeah. You gotta grow TAM, reshape TAM, change yeah. TAM, not look at the existing yeah. incumbent TAM, and the shadow market lets you do that. So how do you put those the two things we, together? So TAM almost by definition is backwards looking, right? Because you're, right, you're looking right. at you know, a market as it stands today. Right. The, the way we try and identify the shadow market is we look at, at the most addicted users of the marketplace. It, it, it's very easy to get distracted by averages, and, and that's typically what your board deck is gonna focus on. Frankly, what I look for more is like, who are your top 1%, your top 2%, the people that are in the product every day, every week, where it's fundamentally changed the way they do X, whatever it is, buying something, selling something, transportation, yeah. Yeah. doesn't really matter. But those are the people that actually kind of surface the shadow market, yeah. I yeah. think, yeah. because they're the ones who are the most committed users. Okay. They're the most interesting to us as early investors, because again, there's typically not millions of people in the service yet. There's maybe thousands or tens of thousands. And so we spent a lot more time looking at that core addicted user base yeah. Yeah. to figure out what could this thing become. It's less about the average user, it's right. more about these addicted ones. And I'd encourage all of you guys, it's very tempting to spend a lot of time and energy kind of focusing on inefficient marketing spend, go goosing up your numbers, thinking that the new investors are gonna focus on that. Person, you should, you should, I'm not sure exactly how you would do it, but we spend a lot more time looking at your core user base and how the addicted Absolutely. users use it. So I think that's a better forward looking indicator of what can the shadow market look like? What does the network effect really turn into over time? And gives us, I think, a more accurate picture of what this thing can be. Yeah. Yeah, when at, at Floodgate, what we end up doing, well, we try to focus on it even at the seed stage, preparing for, you know, meeting you guys and getting Series A and beyond financing, is to just basically try to hack value before you hack growth. Like it, like pumped up numbers mean absolutely nothing. Like they're very temporary, and it's a waste of your life to have a to have an inflated number. Like that's the the, the worst thing you can do, and so that sort of brings me to my, well, one quick story about Matt. <laughs> Which he's like, I don't, I don't, what story do you have? So at Floodgate, we have a nickname for Matt. I'm not sure if it's a common nickname, but the nickname is the Cohort Whisperer. <laughs> so, so in the, like to that, to that end, like how do you guys think about the raw quantitative assessment of a new company? Like how are you looking? Because you just mentioned the cohort of like the most addicted users. How do you guys think about that assessment? This, this cohort thing is actually really simple. I, like, I don't know what the nickname situation is, but really there's no, <laughs> I must have done that. There's, right? there's, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, Roger said it already. I think what you're really trying to get at is, you know, uh, one of my favorite sayings, which Roger spoke to is, averages always lie. And, you know, I think that's like a really important thing to internalize as you're kind of trying to understand and measure what's going on in your marketplace. The average tells you nothing. What matters is what are, you know, what's sitting underneath that and what's, the average is an output, not an input, and it's the inputs that matter. Um, I agree completely with the notion that you want to see if there's this addicted group of users for, for the service and, and then double click on why are they addicted, how do they get addicted, what exactly are they doing, what sort of behavior changes this relative to what was happening before. And the best way to do that, I think on both the demand side and the supply side, the buyer side and the seller side, is to look at cohort data. Um, and you know, I'm, most people in the room probably know what I'm talking about, so forgive me if this is redundant. But basically, it's simply saying, let's look at all of the people who were onboarded into the service during a given period of time, whether on the demand side or the supply side. 
um, and call that a cohort. All the, all the buyers or sellers who came in the month of January of 2018, the month of February of 2018, et cetera. And then over time, let's track those people's ongoing usage of the service to see how engaged they're remaining over time. Um, and you know, it's, it speaks to this notion that you were getting at earlier, which is I think whether in marketplaces or social or in other businesses, there's sort of this cult of growth and growth hacking that's uh, developed in an unhealthy way, I think, over the last few years. Maybe it's course corrected a little bit. Um, but growth is only an amplifier of what you've got. And if what you've got does not have durable engagement, all you're doing is amplifying churn. And so you know, what you have to do is you've got to start out by developing something that's got engagement, then figure out how you retain that engagement, and then you can grow that retained engagement. But you gotta actually put growth beyond, behind the, the retention of the engagement, and the best way to measure whether that's happening or not is by looking at cohorts, and cohorts is what teases out, really answers your, you know, asks and answers your question of, are there people who are addicted here? Are there people here who are becoming dependent on this? Whether they're dependent as, as buyers or dependent on sellers, I think it's, it's really critically important on the seller side too, as part of a litmus test. You know, remember I asked that question earlier at the beginning: Are the buyers and sellers starting to see this as the preferred place where they do this, or the only place where they do this? Um, I'm on the board of a marketplace uh, business called First Dibs, which most people probably don't know. It's a it's a vertical business, um, and I don't know that you know it's it's not the TAM is not the whole universe, but it's a very deep vertical business, and occasionally um, in that business, the supply side, the dealers and galleries that are our suppliers in the marketplace, it's a, it's a high-end collectibles marketplace. Um, occasionally, if they behave badly, we ask them to leave the platform. And when that happens, they literally fly to the company's office from wherever they are around the world, come to reception, and beg to talk to the CEO to be let on, to let back on. And th you know that's an indication of how much it matters for them as suppliers. Farfetch, which is another fantastic vertical marketplace, which unfortunately we're not investors in, I don't know if you guys are. I wish. Um, yeah, it's, it's an unbelievable business. They're seeing an even stronger version of this, I think, or an equally strong version of this. Actually, we see the same thing at First Dibs, which is some of the suppliers who traditionally have been, Farfetch is a marketplace of boutiques around the world. Um, some of the suppliers have actually shut down their physical storefront presences or vastly reduced their physical storefront presences um, and said, you know what, we're just going to go all in on the platform and we're going to do all of our business through this platform. Um, so, you know, you're not going to see that at the Series A level or the Series B level, but if you look at the cohorts and look for the addicted buyers and sellers, you'll start to see a signal that that might be possible. Yeah. So j just building on that, if I do, just to try and summarize the feedback. So segmentation and really deeply understanding who your most loyal, most addicted users are, and then cohorting. And I get those two things together, if you get that as kind of a practice and part of your DNA and how you run the business, you will understand your marketplace much better than, I think, again, trying to goose the numbers through paid acquisition or, or do other things through growth, growth hacking that really aren't sustainable, durable channels for growth. And so spend a lot of time around the segmentation exercise to really understand the core users, go through the cohorting act process to really understand what their, their lifetime value is. And then what we do internally, we run something called a growth efficiency analysis. And we kind of plot uh, 200 public and private companies against uh, one another in terms of, of not only like what is your CAC to LTV, but how quickly is the payback period? You know, because there, there's a spectrum here. You can afford to actually have a long payback period if you have a very high uh, a renewal rate and a very active uh, buyer over time. If you don't, if you're like a travel OTA, like a booking.com or Expedia, and you only get one or two transactions a year, you gotta make sure you make money on that first transaction. And so depending on the structure of your marketplace, you've gotta make certain trade-offs between payback period and lifetime value. And so there's an efficient frontier, and depending on where you fit on this frontier, you know, we'll see it as a potentially really interesting investment, largely organically driven, uh, with very sticky users and, and very kind of high repeat rates that typically yields a good marketplace. Ones where there's a lot of marketing spend, 
they're obviously you know, not that sticky, they're not transacting as much, they're gonna fall below this efficient frontier and they're not gonna really, we believe, have a durable business. So, so we do a lot of analysis around kind of both you know, acquisition retention on the buy side and the sell side, but if you don't do the, uh, that core segmentation and that cohorting, you're gonna, you're gonna end up in the wrong place. Thanks. So one of the things that I, I mean, at least as an entrepreneur, I always heard about marketplaces was, oh, well, marketplaces are hard because they're always supply side constrained. And like the way that we've been talking about it today has been a little bit more on the demand side and understanding the growth and the, you know, the addiction, as you said, around the, the specific, um, you know, most engaged cohorts. So on the supply side, like how do you know when you're supply side saturated or you're no longer supply side constrained? And up until that point, how do you handle supply? You can start with Roger. <laughs> so um, we, we uh, segment marketplaces into kind of commodity. Is this the question you sent me via email that I didn't see? <laughs> yeah, I've got to think of my feet here. Um, we, we, think, we think about supply in two ways. There, there's kind of homogenous supply and heterogeneous supply. And homogenous supply, Uber is a good example, where an Uber driver is an Uber driver. Heterogeneous supply is like Airbnb, where not all houses are the same. And we think typically it can be more expensive to acquire heterogeneous supply because there's typically just more work involved with getting you know, the actual um, homeowners on board. And each house is incrementally you know, unique and different and potentially creates a deeper moat because it is such a unique experience. Um, in homogenous supply, we think it's, it's typically, it can still be expensive, uh, but it's, it's easier potentially to lose that supply to a Lyft or somebody else that may offer a similar service. I'm sure, what was the second half of the question? Sorry, I missed. It's how do you know? How do you know? What do you? How do you handle it? Uh, how do you handle supply until you become supply side saturated? How do you grow it? What's your philosophy on that? Because at your at your stage, and time is almost up, I recognize. Yeah. But at your stage, you're probably seeing a little bit of the balancing act still. I mean, I would, it really depends on the marketplace. And for a series A market, honestly, what we bias towards is if we can find supply where. Um, we can access a pool, even if it's homogenous, that has been non-existent in the on-demand world. So we're involved with one company, as an example, um, where their labor pool is 20 and 30-something year old women who typically have not been involved in the on-demand economy. Um, they actually pay us to participate. And so it's this really interesting dynamic where we don't have to acquire the, the labor because it's a pool that historically just hasn't been involved. So ideally, if we can find that type of of supply, that's the ideal situation, but it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Well, we could obviously go on for another two to three hours about all of this stuff. Um, just wanted to thank my, uh, my panelists, Matt Kohler from Benchmark and Roger Lee from Battery. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>